prazer, na verdade, anunciar o início do segundo painel uh, e convidar para compor o painel. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, the members of this second panel of uh, our seminar uh, to come over to the, uh, to the table, Professor uh, Sam Pondo, Professor Aurio Toledo, and uh, Miguel Borba. So, please, we're ready to start. running a bit late. Thank you for being here uh, this morning uh, for this panel and being here present for the seminar. I'd like to, uh, before introducing our guests, uh, just to uh, give a special thanks once again to the uh, translators uh, who are uh, engaged in uh, uh, offering us a simultaneous translation of the proceedings. Uh, I'd like also to um, uh, note to our distinguished, uh, my colleagues, distinguished panelists, uh, that these are um, uh, interns of the uh, simultaneous translation course here at uh, Pukirio. Uh, so they're not yet fully professionalized uh, in their craft. They're, I'm sure they're doing a great job. Um, but uh, just uh, caveat is just to um, ask all of you to speak uh, as um, clearly and slowly as possible without compromising, of course, uh, uh, the narrative of, uh, of your speech. Um, and um, yeah, anyway, uh, I think that's for the benefit um, of, uh, of all of us. Uh, so uh, this uh, second panel uh, of our um, event, Postcolonialism and its uh, Fragments, um, has as a title Racism, Humanitarian Reason, and uh, Postcolonial Intervention. So um, it's basically an attempt to reflect on the contribution of postcolonial thought um, uh, for a critique of uh, certain kinds of interventionism that have been going on in uh, in the past uh, decade or so uh, that we could we here we denominate it as postcolonial interventionism that is interventionism humanitarian interventionism um, uh, engaged by uh, postcolonial states. So uh, uh, for some uh, interpreters of uh, the humanitarian regime, uh, this has led to a different kind of uh, politics of uh, humanitarianism, sometimes uh, more horizontal, sometimes more uh, attuned to local particularities of uh, the post-colonial situation. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, it also uh, uh, often is object of uh, critique critique uh, in the countries who engage on, with interventionism and also critique by international scholars in a way that, well, you know, humanitarianism, as some of uh, the, our colleagues here on the, uh, on the panel will say, has to do with, often, with uh, a project of uh, a certain moral code that allows for the reconstituting of modern societies or states or certain national identities in the form of uh, helping others, right? Um, uh, in, in, uh, in one case, uh, I'd like to cite uh, one, of, uh, one of Samuel Pondo's contributions 
to uh, the book he edited with Mike Shapiro's, uh, with Mike Shapiro, uh, New Violent Cartographies. Um, uh, Mike, uh, Sam says, attempts to respond to violence, cruelty, and death in the world through the production of a concept of humanity and an idea of diplomacy predicated on moral certainty, resentment, and consensual community. So nowhere is the production of a consensual moral humanity as the recognition and care for the vulnerability of the any subject whatever clearer than in the responses to extreme violence in Africa. So this is also, uh, Sam will be talking about the example of, um, of Africa as uh, the object of this uh, moral uh, disposition, if you want, that inspires humanitarianism. Um, and we'll try to see how uh, former slaveholding countries such as Brazil also, uh, where racism is still present and often uh, uh, not part of uh, public discussion, um, ha is actually uh, uh, reproduced and uh, expressed in its humanitarian uh, ambitions in the Caribbean, um, uh, tied to a discourses of um, a greater role in world politics, and how has, that has to do with a kind of a, a racial reprodu reproduction of uh, violence and stratification in Brazil itself. Anyway, that's I think also the uh, something that will be debated here in this panel. In any case, this is a uh, well more political, uh, perhaps less theoretical uh, reflection on what post-colonialism uh, can bring to the reflection about uh, international politics, of an important issue in international politics, uh, but also its limits, right? Because often uh, post-colonialism is mobilized to legitimize what post-colonial states are doing uh, in uh, the humanitarian uh, or developmentalist, or the South South Corporation, or whatever uh, kind of policies or diplomacies, as Sam says, uh, in the third world, or whatever, or in the peripheries, or, or uh, anyway, that kind of um, um, the spatial definition of where uh, the moral community can can take place. So that's that's more or less the um, the. Uh, desire or at least uh, the attempt uh, to get a discussion going in this panel. I'd like to thank very much uh, the participants. Um, I'd like to introduce briefly for the benefit of time, uh, Samson uh, Opondo. Uh, Samson uh, got his uh, degree in the University of Hawaii at Manoa under, uh, under uh, Mike Shapiro. And his research is guided by an interest in colonialism, race, and the mediation of estrangement. With an emphasis on violence, ethics, and diplomacies of everyday life, he engages in the problematics of humanitarianism, the politics of redemption, and popular culture in urban Africa. He teaches courses on comparative politics, settler, settler colonialism, and post-colonial diplomatic cultures in African cities. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam, for being here. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Audio Toledo from the University uh, Federal de Uberlândia. And uh, he got his uh, degree in political science at the University of um, São Paulo. Um, uh, he was a visiting scholar in Manchester, UK. His main areas of interest are theories of IR, mainly post-structural and post-colonial perspectives. Uh, discourse theory and Ursula Laclau's discourse theory and international security, with particular attention to peace building uh, debates. Uh, Audio has published uh, quite a few articles actually on peace building uh, in, uh, in, in very interesting and innovative ways, mobilizing actually the, the literature on, on post colonialism and, and, well, I'm critical thinking in IR. And I thank him very much for being here. Once again with us, uh, Audio, who is part also of the original uh, group of post-colonial um, 
uh, theory network. Uh, Miguel Barbasa um, got his master's degree uh, here at uh, Erie, but also at uh, Essex University in England. Um, he's currently a PhD candidate here at Erie Pucurio. Uh He has worked in uh, an NGO called the Institute for Alternatives, Alternative Policies for the Southern Cone, and uh, is now uh, working on development theories, Latin American studies, post-colonial elites, um, international relations theory, and critical security studies. Uh, he's now working also in his research for his PhD dissertation on the concept of Haitianism. And I think that's a little bit of what he's going to talk about. I forgot to mention my supervisor. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, he's a, well, that doesn't really matter right now. So thanks, everyone, uh, for for coming to this panel. Um, my intention originally was to give everyone 20 minutes. Um, I think we are a bit short of time. So I'll reduce the 20 minutes to 17, um, <laughs> hoping that it will benefit uh, the discussion uh, right afterwards. So we'll start with uh, Sam, uh, then Audio, and then uh, Miguel. Okay, thanks very much, Sam. Uh, thank you, Joao, for the introduction, and thanks. Yeah, phones off, please. Thank you. And thanks to the um, conference organizers for inviting us and for being very hospitable. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk about uh, it resonates with some of what was spoken about in the previous panel, uh, but I'll be looking at it uh, with what I'd say is uh, a broader necrography. Yeah, a different space of death. Not only the death that takes place at Fortress Europe's gates, but what exactly is happening in the elsewheres or in other times? Uh, what is happening in Somalia, for instance, uh, or in the Kenyan refugee camps that are being closed that actually are pushing people to make, take the dangerous journey through uh, the deserts, uh, we hear less about the death in the desert, but a lot of what's happening in the Mediterranean. So even the partial cartography of death that is being used to talk about this. But before doing that, there are, I'd say, some broad contours that uh, I'll speak about and uh, engage the policies uh, and realignments in governance and diplomacy on a global scale that are creating what uh, one might call new world forms. Uh, for many years, uh, my thinking about diplomacy was moving away from uh, engaging state diplomacy and thinking about the pluralization of diplomacy, the multiple diplomacies that take place uh, out of the level and gaze that we are told to look at diplomacy. So the everyday <coughs> diplomacies of everyday life. Uh, but what I found particularly interesting was how critical diplomatic theories, whether it's James Dadarian's thinking of diplomacy as mediation of estrangement, Costas Constantino's work, or Noe Konagui's work on the pluralization of diplomacy, is now being deployed by the U.S. State Department. Yeah, what happens when the State Department starts using critical discourses yeah, in its own work? Uh, what happens? when, for instance, uh, the Obama administration yeah, says that it is departing from George W. Bush's uh, good Muslim, bad Muslim, uh, and counterinsurgency politics, and coming up with a whole different regimen that doesn't essentialize Islam, and, and starts thinking of what they're calling countering viol violent extremism, being interested in vulnerabilities and resilience of communities in other parts of the world. So the uh, countering terrorism becomes something that is taking place in the inner cities of New York, but at the same time in refugee camps in Kenya, in Minnesota. Yeah, the whole notion that you're radicalizing youth in Minnesota and making sure that you are addressing poverty in Minnesota in Nairobi so as to stop people from joining Al-Shabaab. Uh, so my thought here explores global practices of biopolitics that extend beyond the national borders and take the whole of humanity as their province. It looks at how attempts to secure 
and optimize conditions of living in Africa are not merely governmental in scope, but also diplomatic in their conceptualization and conduct. Uh, in making this exploration, I'm interested uh, in making this exploration, uh, I'm interested, sorry, I lost exactly what I was reading. Yeah. Uh, in making this uh, exploration, I'm interested in how the merging of diplomacy, defense, and development, or the three Ds, as practiced by the US Africa Command, seeks to extend biopolitical possibilities, and how this entails engaging what are called ungoverned spaces and enhancing life and shaping ways of living in areas that cannot be fully governed or resist domestication. Among other things, I'd like to assess the pluralization of diplomatic theory and the practice characterized by the militarization of diplomacy and development and simultaneously think about the diplomatization of the military. What happens when the military starts saying that they're moving from hand grenades to handshakes? Yeah, as part of their effort, or having embedded anthropologists with the human terrain system. Uh, and right now, even calling for literary theorists to be able to read radicalization narratives. Uh, and to be able to think about these new forms of outreach in the Horn of Africa and in other parts of the world. At stake in this exploration is an ethically inflected critique of the 3D mediated regimes of life production and their related forms of conduct through a recognition of the numerous ways in which lives, relationships, and conducts are negotiated in the post-colony. Uh, the broad contours, uh, or rather the scaffolding that I'm using to do this, is to think critically about what uh, the emerging of diplomacy, defense, and development under what the U.S. State Department is calling uh, the 3D effort. And the simultaneous or underbelly of this approach, which is called a whole of society approach, taking place under the uh, countering violence extremism effort. And we could well, name a whole series of practices that are taking place here. For instance, you're having uh, the US military going out to villages in Ethiopia uh, under what they're calling the VETCAP effort and uh, inoculating or vac uh, vaccinating sheep and goats. Yeah? Or the dent cap efforts where they're going out and doing dentist work in multiple places. And you have to ask what exactly is happening with this transformational diplomatic effort and what does it mean when we start thinking biopolitics. So people who have been thinking about global biopolitics, extending Michel Foucault's work, for instance, do not fully appreciate how the biopolitical mode uh, is not only governmental but also diplomatic, such that it becomes much more fruitful when you do not only think of biopolitics, but simultaneously think of the necropolitics that underlines it, and ultimately the biodiplomacy uh, that uh, moves it in different ways. I won't speak about that in detail. I'll carry out a different move that takes my paper somewhere closer to Ranjana's work here. Uh, in his address to a round table at the United Nations Humanitarian Summit held in Istanbul on 23rd to 24th May of 2016, William Ruto, the Deputy President of Kenya, reiterated the country's commitment to the closure <coughs> of the complex of five camps in northern Kenya, collectively called the Dadaab refugee camp. This call for the closure of Dadaab and the repatriation of refugees took place against the backdrop of Kenyan Defense Forces presence in Somalia as part of Operation Linda Inchi and the November 2013 tripartite agreement between Kenya, Somalia, and the UNHCR that was signed after Al-Shabaab attack on Nairobi's Westgate Mall. Noting that the camp was not only an economic uh, uh, but also an ecological uh, burden to the government of Kenya. Ruto went forth to state, and here I'm quoting, this radicalization by extremist elements in the camp, especially of young people, end of quote. More specifically, he considered the dub to have lost its humanitarian character, and, uh, and this is owing to its 25-year existence and functional permanence. It had instead mutated into a center of radicalism, planning, and training of Al-Shabaab terrorists, as well as a conduit for contraband goods, weapons, electronics, 
and sugar, which he stated was killing the local industries. As such, the resilience of the Dab as a site of refuge was not only seen as a burden, but had been, was considered an existential security threat to Kenya, and its closure and repatriation of refugees was presented as something that would ensure Kenya's national security and the fulfillment of Somali citizens and international communities' shared responsibility in Somalia. In characterizing the camp as such, Ruto was recognizing that the Dab was not a generic refugee camp or humanitarian zone, but had become what the urban anthropologist Michel Ajie calls the city camp. So what happens when a camp stays uh, for so long that it becomes, it starts assuming the character of a city? What kind of infrastructure is this? You see it in the Dab, you're seeing it in Gaza and other parts of the world. So how do we think about this city camp phenomenon? Uh, which he says is a novel, hybrid, and social spatial form in which new identities crystallize and subjectivization takes root. The fact that the dub is a built environment that is at once informal and improvisational as well as operational means that it cannot be reduced to a conven conventional humanitarian space unless the logic of humanitarianism itself changes to that of what people call resiliency humanitarianism. Well, such that it's not about the UNHCR uh, doing all the work for provisioning, but it creates conduits that the refugees can start, uh, you know, doing their small trade. Uh, universities are being opened in refugee camps, yeah, computer labs, uh, and the people who are actually celebrating this whole notion that the camp isn't just a space of bare life. Yeah, yeah, so it's contra Agamben's thinking of the refugee camp as a domain of bare life, and we are appreciating this notion that refugees have agency. Refugees have uh, a political life. They're much more complex and resilient beings. That is what I'd say sometimes they're much more romantic vision of what is happening here. If we take seriously what happens when resiliency is not just an ethical, uh, or an appreciated fact of life, but when resiliency becomes a regime of government. And I'll speak about that shortly. The uncertainty over the ambiguous status of the camp, its survival economy, transnational relations, and bordering practices it instantiates renders this space suspect. It is for these reasons that successive Kenyan governments seek to put the camp to a new use as a casserole space, assert its humanitarian character, or do away with it altogether as a way of rendering the Kenyan rather than the camp population as resilient. As a paradigm, resilience thinking has gained significant attention and is being deployed by multiple actors in their governance and planning initiatives insofar as African and other societies are concerned. In its most hegemonic form, resilience is presented, and here I'm quoting, the ability of a community, people, state or region to adapt new processes, norms and strategies for conducting their lives and new societal relationships in response to a violent shock or uptick in aggression and brutality in order to prevent, mitigate or recover from violence." End of quote. Besides its prominence in the European Union global strategy, resilience as the capacity of a social system to self-organize or for society to transform itself as it seeks to establish a new peaceful e equilibrium has been articulated and implemented through efforts such as the USAID's framework for analyzing resilience in fragile and conflict-affected states. Under this framework, the agency focused on the society in questions capacity to adapt to external shock, be they economic, environmental, security, political, or societal, or social. Uh, and identifiable in some of this discourse surrounding the calls for the closure of the Dab refugee camp is a perverse uh, version of this resilience discourse, where the refugee is simultaneously thought of as a resilient uh, yet vulnerable subject, as a dangerous subject because of their resilience. Yeah? The fact that they're not just receiving food aid and they're trading the food aid is presented as, yes, something we should appreciate. You know, you're not just uh, bare life. But at the same time, that ingenuity is what is being presented as dangerous because the same circuits of trade 
are being presented as what is being giving them the capacity to actually act as a conduit for the Al-Shabaab, among other uh, dangerous groups. Interestingly enough, the state and its citizenry too also turns to the discourse of resilience as it uh, sets the parameters for its engagement with refugees, the international community, and the ever-present threat of terrorism. Rather than read the refugee camp as a humanitarian infrastructure, <clears throat> sorry, that remakes both the city and the camp through collaborations and innovations that give rise to remark remarkably heterogeneous domain of people, the improvisational movement within the camp and between the city and the camp is seen as an entrepreneurial force to be harnessed or something to be criminalized. This security discourse transforms the management of refugee populations from a humanitarian or administrative affair into a criminal or geopolitical affair characterized by mass incarceration, removal, and reencampment of refugees, thus contributing to the xenophobic policies and popular imaginaries that aggregate refugees and asylum seekers into manageable human herds through recourse to the national and racial categories. And there's a whole set of policies, not only in Kenya, but uh, you're seeing it playing out uh, in the UK after the Manchester attacks, you're seeing it playing out in France, uh, Belgium, and other places. So what I'm interested in here, and uh, uh, it's actually, I'd say, Joao gives us the double challenge of both speaking slowly and having less time. Yeah, <laughs> a, a double interdiction, yeah, but uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, just compress uh, what I'm trying to get at here, uh, and that means that I have to lose the script, uh, is uh, to be able to think critically uh, how the shifting in the discourse of governance, most so with regard to, uh, with regard to the question of what is being called countering violent extremism, yeah, is becoming a dominant mode. Uh, part of it, and this is how the official script reads, that counter insurgency itself does not work. Yeah, it actually contributes to the radicalization of, 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 of youth in different parts of the world. Yeah, the drone strikes, yeah, having boots on the ground and other forms of military intervention is being presented as a problematic mode. And for those who are critically oriented, people who are critical of the violence of the state, this is taken as, we'd say, a gain yeah, or a win. Uh, Counter-terrorist efforts uh, are being presented as also inadequate. Yeah? The profiling of uh, people in New York streets, stop and frisk and other forms, we have carried out a critique of this racialization. Uh, what has happened and is less spoken about is how the shift in ethical discourse with regard to countering terrorism is opening up a whole different domain. Yeah, these CVE efforts, yeah, where the supposedly less racially problematic discourse yeah, is now being militarized. Yeah, imams are being called to engage the police. Yeah, so there's dialogue between uh, the mosque and the church. The state is saying that it's no longer only interested in the dangerous uh, youth uh, as people who are already engaged in a cell, but it's interested in, in a preventive uh, gesture to be able to capture people before they are radicalized. So the preemptive strike that George Bush, for instance, was very much engaged in becomes part of a preventive apparatus. What reading the Dub Refugee Camp, for instance, uh, offered in thinking uh, for me over here, was to be able to see how this shifts in governance regimens. Yeah? The shift from only thinking about the already radicalized dangerous terrorists uh, to a thinking and interest in vulnerable communities. Yeah? The refugee as potential terrorist, for instance. Yeah? The interest in poor Muslim youth as potentially radicalized youth, yeah? or even non-Muslim communities as potentially dangerous. The multiple forms of biopolitics that are at play in that domain, but the much more insidious necropolitics that takes place elsewhere, 
that sustains this particular regimen. And I'll, I think uh, as we continue speaking about this, uh, I uh, have an opportunity to flesh this out. But uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't state that in the context of uh, the refugee camp that I was looking at here, uh, it becomes very clear that humanitarianism is predicated on an ontology of inequality. Yeah, whether it's that between saviors and survivors, yeah, or between multiple forms of saviors, and Didier Fasson's work has done a great job in illustrating this. But here we're seeing how that ontology of inequality, uh, or inequality of the human, becomes mobilized for policing purposes. And we might want to ask much more critical questions on the work that resilience thinking and resiliency as a discourse enables in these anti-radicalization efforts. Yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you for your patience uh, and for speaking slowly and shortly. Uh, um, so next, uh, we have uh, Audio. Audio, 17 minutes for you, too. Uh, and my apologies for <laughs> reducing your time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the Institute of International Relations of Pukihiu for organizing this second seminar on decolonizing IR. It's a true pleasure to be here among good friends to discuss, but mainly to learn. No less important, I'd like to thank you, Professor João, for inviting me to this panel today uh, to discuss such important theme. Uh, as I was asked to write a text in Portuguese in order to help the translator, even though I've, I've sent it a bit late, <laughs> sorry, translators, <laughs> I will stick to it. So I'm sorry for switch languages right now. Uh, antes de começar, eu queria retomar um argumento escrito na década de 70 pela antropóloga é, britânica Wendy James. É, num trabalho dela, é, num livro editado pelo Talal Assad, ela descreveu o, o trabalho do antropólogo como de um imperialista relutante. E esse antropólogo que ela está falando é justamente o antropólogo do período colonial. Ela vai argumentar que esse uh, trabalho desse antropólogo colonial ele é bastante ambivalente. Há um só tempo em que esse antropólogo colonial ele tem uma defesa das populações nativas, e é um crítico do colonialismo europeu, é, ele precisa da, da, de autorizações das, atividades, das, das autoridades coloniais para poder trabalhar. Então, não à toa, se a gente pegar gigantes como Evans Pritchard, Malinovis, que a gente vai ver que esses caras defendiam o caráter aplicado dos seus conhecimentos para ajudar os nativos. No entanto, eles precisavam da expansão Desse, desse, desse colonialismo para poder trabalhar. Então, ela vai dizer, em última instância, que esses antropólogos, uma parte deles, seriam radicais frustrados, né, por conta dessa ambivalência com a qual eles trabalham. Eu vou deixar esse argumento em suspenso, mas eu vou retomá-lo daqui um pouquinho. É, eu vou dividir, então, é, à luz desse argumento, a minha intervenção em três momentos. O primeiro, é, eu queria de forma telegráfica, sintetizar ah, o debate crítico sobre a paz liberal, a ideia de que podemos transformar as sociedades saídas de conflito em democracias liberais orientadas para o mercado, é, para mostrar como é que se chegou ao seu desdobramento mais recente, que é a virada local. Em seguida, eu vou me estender um pouquinho mais na forma como o hibridismo, na sua extração pós-colonial e, sobretudo, no trabalho do Omibaba, ele é incorporado a essa discussão. E aqui é onde eu quero é, discutir um primeiro argumento que eu pretendo defender. Tomando de empréstimo o título do seminário, eu vou defender que a, a apropriação do conceito de hibridismo do Baba nas discussões sobre peace building foi fragmentária. Né? O que, que eu estou querendo dizer? Trocando em miúdos, é, na, na minha avaliação, pelo menos, a, essa apropriação foi privilegiou a dimensão ontica do hibridismo, porém se esquivou do fato de que o hibridismo é, a minha avaliação, uma dimensão ontológica. Né? E isso vai trazer problemas, 
para essa discussão, sobretudo quando a gente pensa a possibilidade de discutir o que é o local que esses caras estão falando. E aí, para tentar contribuir para essa discussão, é que eu proponho interpelar nessa né, discussão sobre o local a partir da categoria de populismo, da forma como o Ernesto Laclau constru, reconstruiu o conceito mais recentemente. Né, então, de forma bem telegráfica mesmo, é, o debate crítico sobre a paz liberal, eu costumo dividi-lo em três posicionamentos. Né. Basicamente, é, a gente teria, de um lado, o um primeiro posicionamento, os reformistas, os caras que argumentam que não há alternativa, é, que eles não disputam o conteúdo político e ideológico da chamada paz liberal. No entanto, eles vão questionar a operacionalização dela em campo. Né, aqui, acho que talvez a figura principal seja o Roland Paris. Né. Em segundo lugar, a gente tem um conjunto de autores que eu, que eu chamo de críticos estruturais, seja na sua matriz neogramixiana, seja na sua matriz foucaultiana, vão, vão questionar operações de paz e esforços de peace building a partir de uma perspectiva, vão interpretá-los como ferramentas para manutenção do status quo. Né? Aí temos Mark Duffield, David Chandler, Laura Zanotti, dentre tantos outros. É... Em seguida, no que a gente chama de virada local, rigorosamente, creio que a gente pode dividi-la em dois momentos. Num primeiro momento, a gente teria, na década de 90, sobretudo os trabalhos do Lederach, que, distoando, por exemplo, de autores como William Zartman, que argumenta que primeiro a gente tem que chegar a um mútuo e danoso impasse para daí começar a construção da paz, o Lederach vai argumentar que é possível semear, construir, ao empoderar as sociedades, locais, a gente pode transformar conflitos, não resolvê-los. Né? É, e aí, recentemente, chegamos agora, a partir de meados dos anos 2000, eu, particularmente, dado, sobretudo, a partir de 2002, com a fundação do, do Journal Peace Building, a, essa segunda virada local, que aí, capitaneada por Oliver Richman, Roger McGuinty e outros caras, eles vão tentar é, aprender perseguir, é, teórica e empiricamente, a ideia de que a paz produzida em situações pós-conflito seria a híbrida, é, oriunda de negociações entre agentes internacionais e atores locais. Né? É, isso permitiu uma oxigenação na área. Né? Vários autores trouxeram é, Baba, Sertor, James Scott, Pierre Bourdieu, enfim, tantos outros, que foram fornecendo os insights para essa para essa, vamos chamar, segunda virada local. Né? Entrando no segundo momento aqui da minha intervenção, é, qual é a especificidade da, da ideia do, do híbrido dentro dessa virada local? Né? O híbrido surge, salvo engano, é, lá em 2007, quando o Volker Bogg, Anne Brown e, os, e seus colaboradores, disputando com o conceito de Estado fracassado, vão argumentar que em determinados... É, situações nós teríamos ordens políticas híbridas. Né? Então, não haveria anarquia, como o, preço, o conceito de Estado fracassado pressupõe, mas sim haveria algum tipo de ordem lá, uma ordem que não, é, não pode ser medida a partir de modelos ocidentais. Né? Haveria alguma outra coisa lá, que inclusive receberia inputs internacionais. Né? É, então, é, a partir desses desenvolvimentos, é, a gente teria, é, esse seria a primeira encarnação, vamos chamar assim, da, da ideia de hibridismo, mas a gente vai ter uma segunda encarnação, que eu chamo, é, que vem aí a partir dos trabalhos do Richmond, do Maguinte, o que hoje alguns eu, eu já vi chamar de escola de Manchester, né? que basicamente a ideia aqui, é, é, inicialmente a ideia era entender, é, usar o hibridismo como uma ferramenta analítica para o desenvolvimento de uma ontologia para a paz que fosse aberta à diferença. Né? Com o caminhar dessas discussões, o hibridismo passou a ser utilizado para descrever a interação entre o local e o internacional, é, no qual ambas esferas coexistiriam e não em uma situação em que uma assimilaria a outra. Né? Ademais, eles vão defender o argumento de que o local seria capaz de resistir, modificar e adaptar a, a, 
a paz liberal. Né? É, isso seria ah, o, o, as possibilidades abertas pelo juridismo em termos analíticos, em termos, em termos normativos, muitos autores passaram a defender a ideia de que o hibridismo poderia ser usado para abrir espaço para potenciais projetos emancipatórios, utilizado sobretudo como um veículo crítico que nos, auxilia, que nos auxiliaria a pensar alternativas ao modelo liberal de construção da paz. Né? Como vocês podem ver, a partir desse arrasoado, é uma discussão bastante controversa. Né? É, várias críticas ao hibridismo em peace building vão argumentar que se esquece, se, o que se negligencia é, por exemplo, a importância de estruturas econômicas e sociais entre os atores, assim como não há uma devida apreciação de como essa paz liberal ela não é só um projeto específico para países saídos de conflitos, ela, ela estaria é, incrustada na própria é, ordem normativa do que nós hoje designamos o internacional. Né? Além disso, e aí há uma outra crítica, né, que essa eu, me parece que não, é, é ainda é pouco explorada, é o fato de que a, é, a hibridização em contextos de construção da paz é muitas vezes pensada vis-à-vis -vis níveis de indigenismo. Né? E, consequentemente, isso leva a uma discussão sobre autenticidade. Né? Eu sempre, nesse momento, eu pego o argumento, por exemplo, do Richmond, quando ele diferencia o que ele chama de local, local, né? um local mais profundo, que não tem tanto acesso aos atores internacionais, e uma sociedade mais, uma sociedade civil mais a, a conectada a esses atores internacionais. Né? Nessa discussão, portanto, é, a gente tem, sobre o hibridismo, a gente tem uma, o hibridismo, portanto, como uma avaliação descritiva para a construção da paz e também um chamamento prescritivo, né, dado que esse hibridismo seria uma possibilidade de um processo mais emancipatório. Né, e é aqui, é nesse momento que eu retomo o argumento da Wendy James, que eu abri lá no começo, né. É, eu acho que há um perigo nessa discussão sobre o hibridismo, né, de termos, digamos assim, peace builders, né, imperialistas relutantes, em alguma medida, porque o que a gente está vendo são esforços internacionais para parcerias, iniciativas locais de ownership e participação também de acadêmicos vinculados a organismos internacionais para o desenho e implementação desses processos. Isso, a meu juízo, é, seria esse perigo desse radical frustrado, desse imperialista relutante, meio que orbitando algumas, alguns desses espaços. Né? Em última instância, o que alguns já estão vendo defender é que o hibridismo vem sendo mobilizado como uma, uma ferramenta para a solução de problemas. Né? E aí, a partir desse perigo, que eu gostaria de acrescentar... A, é, Antes de acreditar, eu gostaria de retornar ao conceito de hibridismo, né? tanto na, quando ele chegou às discussões de peace building, mas, sobretudo, também quando ele é pensado na, nas discussões pós-coloniais. Né? Quando o hibridismo vem para as discussões de peace building, ele foi visto como uma alternativa por um grupo de pesquisadoras e pesquisadores críticos para compreender por que intervenções internacionais, depois de conflitos violentos, fracassavam em alcançar os seus objetivos. Né? Esse era o propósito do hibridismo. O propósito esse, oriundo de uma crise de legitimidade, dado que o modelo proposto não seria representativo das pessoas que, em tese, eram alvo dos ditos processos, projetos emancipatórios. Né? É, adicionalmente, aí pensando agora o hibridismo a partir da extração pós-colonial, é, na minha avaliação, pelo menos, dentro da literatura pós-colonial que eu consigo acompanhar, o hibridismo emerge com o intuito de compreender a capacidade de agência na luta contra a assimilação, proporciona uma, uma saída para o pensamento binário, penso pelo menos é essa a ideia, e, em, em última instância, pode contribuir também para a reestruturação e estabilização de relações de poder assimétricas. É aqui, então, que eu vejo a diferença na forma como o hibridismo está no peace building e na forma como ele foi pensado a partir do, do pensamento pós-colonial, sobretudo no Baba. Né? Aqui eu vejo o peace building resumindo-se a uma dimensão ontica do problema, 
né? o que, portanto, habilitaria você pensar a combinação institucional, trazer ordens locais e combiná-las com, com projetos internacionais, ou mesmo, como a gente está vendo agora, desenvolver o conceito de resiliência em discussões sobre construção da paz, em que ah, o local seria, é, proporcionando, estaria proporcionando insumos para a construção da paz, e se, e aí é o argumento que eu já vi em algum momento ser desenvolvido, se o local resiste, se ele produz insumos, então, em última instância, a gente nem precisa mais intervir. Né? É só deixar eles se virem lá mesmo, né? não há necessidade de se fazer muito mais coisa. Né? No entanto, pelo menos na minha leitura do Baba, o hibridismo é uma categoria ontológica, não é apenas ontica. Né? Se o hibridismo é possível, é justamente pelo fato de que os sistemas culturais eles se articulam não porque eles têm conteúdos semelhantes ou familiares, mas sim porque eles, são, eles formam símbolos, eles formam sujeitos, subjetividades, eles formam práticas é, interpelativas. Né? No entanto, eu tendo a concordar com a letra Norval, quando ela argumenta que se o, o híbrido é uma condição geral de identidades, né, seja em termos históricos ou teóricos, ele acaba, muitas vezes, virando algo inescapável, né? um dado inescapável. Né? E, muitas vezes, isso é, desincentivaria a necessidade de uma compreensão é, mais refinada da, da sua articulação e da própria construção do híbrido. Né? É, nesse sentido, é aqui nesse momento que eu, rapidamente, dado o meu tempo está correndo, é apresentar como alternativa para a gente pensar o hibridismo a ideia de populismo, tal como o Ernesto Laclau vai é, apresentar. Né? A, primeiro, antes de mais nada, o Laclau parte de uma premissa de que uma sociedade reconciliada consigo mesmo, uma, tem, que tem um telos que pode unificar tudo, é é, é um, para ele é impossível. Né? Não há nada, não há uma lógica transcendental, assim como não há um agente privilegiado de mudança histórica. Né? que a gente pensa como universal no Laclo seria um particular que, em algum momento, a partir de uma conjuntura política precisa, se tornou hegemônico. E isso, para ele, abre possibilidades para diversos tipos de luta possível. Né? É, no, no, especificamente sobre o, o, o conceito de populismo, o conceito de populismo para o Laclo é muito diferente dos do, do, do nossos entendimentos tradicionais que a gente escuta sobre populismo. Populismo, para ele, é uma categoria também ontológica e não ontica. Né? É um conceito formal, né? dado que suas características definidoras elas são relacionadas exclusivamente a uma forma específica de articulação, independente dos conteúdos que se articulam. Né? E aí, nesse sentido, né? é importante também reter que o povo, para o Laclo, não é, é uma categoria estática que pode ser medida em termos econômicos, ele é uma construção política e discursiva, e, como tal, vai variar entre as mais diversas experiências populistas. Né? O povo pode ser evocado como o discurso dos mais pobres, como dos mais ricos, mas também pode ser os discursos dos nacionais contra os estrangeiros, ou, como eu quero propor, o discurso do local vis-à-vis -vis a paz liberal. Né? É aqui que eu acho que esse conceito poderia, e é isso que eu tenho tentando desenvolver mais recentemente. Se a gente parte do princípio de que o povo é uma construção política, uma construção discursiva, é, e, e vamos tentar trazer isso para a discussão sobre peace building, o um local seria também politicamente construído, né, e, sobretudo, em relação com a, a paz liberal. Portanto, a, a implicação que eu quero deixar aqui é que, a, o que nós chamamos de internacional estaria, em última instância, sobre, muito implicado na própria construção política do que está se chamando local. Não dá para desvincular as duas coisas. E vice-versa. O que se entende por local é, seria construído, seria, seria construído a partir dessa relação com o internacional, porém, o internacional também. Não à toa a gente vai ver em locais como Moçambique, por exemplo, Atores que, em tese, a gente consideraria, consideraria como locais extremamente transnacionalizados. Né? E isso tem implicações significativas, a meu juízo, para a análise política. Eu, eu encerro por aqui, para não estourar muito tempo, depois a gente pode conversar um pouco mais. Muito obrigado.
Obrigado, Áureo. Obrigado uh, pela síntese e pela observação do tempo. A gente vai poder voltar aí no debate as questões que você levanta. Uh, sorry, um, I should have been doing English. Uh, so next we have uh, Miguel. Thank you, João. Uh, 17 minutes. Yes. Okay. Let me just police myself as well. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the Institute uh, on this event and thank you, the organizers, uh, for inviting me, especially João, to participate on this uh, session. And I will, I will share with you some reflections, uh, not many, uh, two, in fact, uh, that are part of my research, my PhD research. Um, on the topic of uh, Haitianism and the Brazilian uh, occupation, military occupation of Haiti, uh, decade long. And anyone which perhaps functions. Yeah. Uh, so uh, while Julia tries to, to bring the video, yes, if you can, if you can bring some sound to us, that'll be great. So uh, let me just explain something before we, we show the video. Yeah, you know my my uninvited guest is already there. And so uh, as long as I'm trained as a as historian, uh, we found it that might be productive to engage Brazilian occupation of Haiti, not from a strictly military or geopolitical, let's say, um, approach, but uh, benefiting from a historical approach. And that leads you directly to the question of Haitianism. Brazil is the country, is the, is the space, is the society, social formation, whatever you like, that had in, its, in a very important moment of its history, a foundational moment, a discursive phenomenon, let's put it like this, called Haitianism. So the Brazilian engagement with Haiti, Brazilian narratives, Brazilian um, uh, utterances regarding Haiti are far um, older than the recent ones regarding MINUSTA. So that's, that's a bit of the idea to, to, to try to understand a bit of the, perhaps the meaning of, of the MINUSTA, which is the, the United Nations mission for stabilizing Haiti. The, the acronym is in French or Portuguese or Spanish. And vis-a-vis -vis the phenomenon of, of Haitianism, in the 19th century uh, state, nation state formation in Brazil. Um, it's a phenomenon, I will, I will not get into this, the specifics of this, of Haitianism, we can talk later if you wish, uh, those who are interested. But I'll just single out that was a phenomenon that started in 1831 and as long as I could reach it, found it until 1836, which means like five years only but intense, intensely mobilized during those five years, which coincide with the regencio, let's say, período regencial, uh, period of Brazilian monarchy, and which was a moment of unrest, of revolts, rebellions, and secession, including uh, regional secessions among elites. So it was a moment of, was an ex exceptional moment, and where rules and norms were being rediscussed and sometimes we affirm, and Haitianism is part of this moment where uh, the very idea of Brazil is being put into question, and, and, the, and the, of course the Brazilians and so on. Um, so I'll try to, to make an argument about this um, creation, recreation, expansion of Brazilian state. Let's just remember that two-thirds of the country didn't uh, uh, exactly uh, obey the, the power-centered created in Rio de Janeiro immediately. That took, some, took a while in order you know, to, to bring the whole country together. Let's just uh, give one example. So the, the argument's a bit about state expansion and uh, centers of power uh, expansion, its reach, or exercising its reach, and what it has to do with uh, social racial relations in, in Brazilian state formation. So I would like to, before I start uh, going to the argument, just to invite you to watch this 30-second clip. It's really short. 
uh, this guest with there's there's no sound. That's very sad. Find sound. Make sound. <laughs> Produce sound. That's very sad. <coughs> All right. So we have no sound. Are you sure everything's plugged? She's afraid now because she's my student, so she might get punished. <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay, forget, Juliet. Thank you. So, uh, I sent you later this clip from George Bush. It's from February 29th, 2004. He's addressing the press at the White House Garden, explaining he had just sent, <clears throat> sorry, three, 300 Marines to, to Haiti in order to, well, let me quote unquote, break with Haiti's past and make the international community uh, fulfill Haiti's constitution and the United States is prepared to help. So that's when MINUSTA, the, the official uh, occupation of Haiti, started, first started. Um, of course, we now know that these were the same people who were talking. Uh, it worked? That's right. Hold on for a second, please. President Aristide uh, resigned. Uh, he has left his country. Uh, the Constitution of Haiti is working. There is an interim president, uh, as per the Constitution, uh, in place. Uh, I have uh, ordered the deployment of Marines as the leading element of an interim international force to help bring order and stability to Haiti. I have done so uh, in working with the international community. This government believes it essential that Haiti have a hopeful future. Uh, this is the beginning of a new chapter in the country's history. I would urge the people of Haiti to reject violence, to give this uh, break from the past a chance to work, and the United States is prepared to help. Thank you. So again, the world Thank watched as. Thank you. So this is a very um, important. Um, speech. It's, of course, we now know today it's the same person who, who was talking about weapons of mass destruction and war on terror and, you know, one year after the invasion of Iraq. So today we know the, the origin of MINUSTA has the same roots in this um, kind of international policy. So what's post-colonial about it? It begs the question because it, it seems more like like neo-colonial or purely colonial, imperialist, if you wish, or whatever, uh, United States invading Caribbean islands, you know, banana republics and so on. Um, well, what is post-colonial about it is that it's Brazil, right? It's Brazil's role, Brazil's leading role in this intervention, like the substitution of those 300 Marines that never actually left, but uh, for UN, UN peacekeepers like Blue Helmets under Brazilian uh, general supervisions and with Brazilian, uh, with the, the largest number of uh, boots on the ground. So, and there we might have some questions to ask and that when it gets interesting in order to, 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 to question uh, what, what this, um, this participation, uh, uh, Brazilian participation on this uh, adventure uh, overseas tells us about Brazil itself. That was one of my um, main in topics of interest. So I would just single out two of them and then uh, hopefully we have some uh, 
time to discuss them. The first one is the desire of govern the ungoverned. Like Haiti is always presented uh, as George Bush also did uh, as an ungoverned place. People over there just don't know how to behave and govern themselves. That's, that's the usual image we get from Haiti. That's why they need external help. So I got it from, I went to, to Haiti at the beginning of this year, uh, interviewing, interviewing Brazilian uh, officials and diplomats and other kinds of people uh, about their um, images of Haiti, uh, questioning them. What, and then something that, that, that came quite a lot was that they are, they are youngsters in the sense that they cannot you know, walk with their own um, legs. That was a kind of expression that came out a lot. And, 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 and that desire of governing the ungoverned, because the ungoverned uh, is the opposite of order, right? It's the opposite of a, a sense of safety, uh, safeness. And it's also found on 19th century discussions around Haitianism. Um, calls, you, you I, I, I've been studying about 40, 40 uh, newspapers, Brazilian newspapers from this uh, period of 19th century, and then you find um, several articles calling for, for you know, police of proximity, as they say. A police that should be very close to these ungoverned places, and not close, but be there constantly. A, a police that uh, would uh, make them feel terrorized and us uh, feel uh, safe. And so there's a, there's a playing out of self-other relationships regarding uh, race and, and uh, class, I would say. And... There are also, you can also find calls for the domestic, domestic use of armed forces in Brazil, which is something that I believe, I believe it resonates uh, with the present also. So you have people calling uh, for a, first a depura depuration of armed forces in, in, in a sense to make it whiter and, and upper classes, so to prevent the, the joining of lower dangerous classes and kind of danger callers uh, to the military, and, and that you find a certain rift between the army and, and the marine forces in Brazil, which live up to the present. And then you, have, you also find calls for the establishment of Brazilian colonies uh, abroad uh, in places identified by its blackness. So coast of Africa, uh, like generally, would, would um, uh, reflect that. And and also, you, you, you usually find a certain authorization, a, uh, a double authorization, at the same time fiscal, budgetary, and legal penal in the punishment. So all means necessary meant all means financially necessary in order to, to avoid a revolution that never happened, uh, a repetition of a Haitian revolution in Brazil that never happened, and all means po uh, police-wise also being deployed. So I think there's a kind of uh, bio-diplomacy, if you wish, Sam, that uh, a 3D approach, uh, which has something that also resonates back to the 19th century. We can discuss that later or not. And, and then I'll leave you a question um, right now about the, the role of, because you write about VETCOM, uh, I, I, I would like to leave you a question about the, the, the cholera outbreak in Haiti like what, which was, you know, brought by the international community itself. I, I, I wonder if it, whether it, you know, uh, denies the argument or make it more explicit in the sense that you bring in the problem together with this so-called so solution. And the second one, uh, the second uh, topic I would like to address very quickly is the question of racial democracy and the question of the good Brazilian. So there's a whole, uh, there's a renewed debate today about racial democracy in Brazil. It's not something that belongs to Gilberto Freire. There's a lot of people today trying to, well, some, uh, all the, some kind of form deny Brazilian races, racism as long as we did, never had Jim Crow laws and something like that. So it's a recurrent theme in Brazilian, I would say, intelligentsia to, to question. Uh, uh, and, and we've been, uh, we are right now in a, another round of questioning. The, there's some kind of historiography which denies the, the racial element during Brazilian slavery, 
And for, in order to do that, they have to deny the, the very existence of Haitianism itself. So there's a, there's a presence-absence uh, relationship being played out here, which I think it's very post-colonial or hybrid, if we wish uh, to call it that way. And then I, I, got, it from, I got it from my interviews, uh, my fieldwork interviews, that same kind of um, discourse being played out in the sense that every, every, each one of them, like soldiers and, of course, diplomats, are usually more prepared, to you know, avoid you know traps, and, but and answering questions to academics, but soldiers would would always uh, tell me that of course they were not racist, they were not uh, well anything bad, let's say. But then, uh, as soon as you turned off the mic and conversation started, you, you got a lot of whole lot of sexism, and a whole lot of racism, of course. So trying to reach out to me uh, using yeah, well football because we're Brazilians. And, but immediately, like women, sex, and, and racism. So um, phrases like, and I cannot prove them because I turned out the mic, but um, some, some of them, they even wrote me on my notebook. But phrases like, uh, don't get into those buses. Like, uh, how, how are you managing to transportation over here in Haiti? Because it's, it's allegedly very violent. And so I was like, hey, I'm taking buses in <laughs> public transportation. And they were like, don't get in the buses, there are too, too many stinking blacks inside. And, and, or regarding um, Haitians, uh, women themselves, with any five dollars, you can have sex with, a hate, with an Haitian girl. His language was far worse than this, of course. And so those, those kinds of uh, um, utterances, they resound back to 19th century Haitianism, in, in my point of view, in the sense that they always are, they are always creating this order uh, with this same of, this type of discourse. Of course, there's hierarchies being played out, but there's a sense of what should uh, the what should black people do? What should these inferior people do in order for them not to be inferior? So that's not, it's not only a case of policing, but enabling them to be well, good Brazilians, good. Haitians governed by Brazilian militaries or NGOs and so on. So there's a, a, something that struck me, struck me analyzing 19th century papers, and I'm about to finish, uh, was that both left and right of the political spectrum, uh, conservatives and liberals of Brazilian, um, of, from Brazilian empire, were both telling black people what to do, how to behave, and how to become a good Brazilian and how to avoid Haitianism, which was an insult, meant the traitor of the cause of Brazil, even though, even if you were, you were white. So it strikes me uh, as like uh, Gayatri Spivak's uh, uh, famous um, constructions of white men telling white, telling black and brown men and women what to do. And I think this is something that we can um, continue discussing, but Finishing why Bush, I think Bush was a lot of, uh, was vehemently uh, analyzed as somebody who brought exception to the to international relations, the exceptionalism which um, characterized the US interventions and so on. I wonder if uh, this discussion of Haitianism and historians who always like to say, huh, this, um, this already happened before, or something over there in the past might uh, be productive for us to understand the present might help us in order to understand how these exceptions turn rule or enable rules or become themselves rules in order to rule other people. Thank you.